Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Curious About Live session. My name is Alicia. I am a science communicator at Glasgow Science Center, and I will be your host for this session. Today, we will be talking with Nikki Finnegan, who is the Head of Communications and Public Relations for Skyrora Limited, an aerospace manufacturing company which specializes in space launches and orbital launch vehicles. That's right, today we will be talking all about rockets, how they are developed, launched, and the important jobs they do in space. We will have some time at the end of the session for Nikki to answer your questions live, so please feel free to pop them in the YouTube chat box. But for now, let's get the session started by handing things over to Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Hi, thank you so much for having me. But thanks for coming. I'm really excited about your, um, your presentation. I've, I've been doing a bit of research on this, and I can't wait to hear all about it. Amazing. Um, so yeah, as Alicia said, um, my name is Nikki and I'm the Head of Communications and Public Relations at Skyrora. I'm really excited to be here today and tell you all about our mission, our rockets, and what they're looking to deliver to space. So I'll just start with a brief overview of our company firstly. I'm just going to go to the next slide. Okay. So Skyrora is a Scotland-based rocket company, and we are looking to put the UK back into orbit. There has never been a vertical rocket launch into space from the UK in history before. The UK used to have a rocket program called Black Arrow back in the 1970s that launched a rocket from Australia, but this program lost funding. And since then, the UK hasn't really had a space program. So therefore, Skyrora is looking to be the first company to do this. And on the screen here, you can see the Black Arrow um, rocket, which was launched in the 1970s. So at the, long, at the moment, there's a long line of satellites waiting in a queue to reach space, but there is no launch service available to get them there. So by creating a launch capability for the UK, Skyrora can increase access to space for these satellites in a sustainable and affordable way. And to do this, Skyrora is developing several environmentally conscious space technologies, including a rocket fuel, which we're making from unrecyclable plastics, typically found in the landfill and ocean. And we also have a 3D printer that we have built ourselves and we use to build all of our rocket engines. And using a 3D printer can help to eliminate wasted resources. So Skyrora also has what's known as a mobile launch complex. And essentially this is a collection of shipping containers um, that fits all of our launch infrastructure and allows us to conduct launch from anywhere in the world that will let us. So over the past five years, Skyrora has developed several rockets as part of our incremental learning approach to launch. This means that we basically started off with very small rocket launches to low altitudes to test our technology. And then we moved on to bigger rockets and higher altitudes as we learned and grew as a team. And this allows our team to collect data and improve the technology on our rockets so that when we're ready for launching into space, we can ensure that we're successful. These smaller rockets are all preparing us for the orbital launch of Skyrora XL, which is that main and largest rocket with the blue nose cone on screen. It's 22 meters tall and has three stages or pieces to it. So the first stage, which is at the bottom, gets the rocket off the ground using a cluster of nine engines. Then the second stage will get the rocket from the atmosphere into space. And finally, the third stage will deliver the satellites into orbit using a reignitable engine that can operate in a vacuum. So we've got a quick video here, which we will show um, what Skyrora XL will look like when it's completed. And you'll notice the video shows the different stages of the rocket coming together, topped off by a payload fairing or nose cone that will protect the items on board. So we'll go ahead and play that video now.
Great. So in a general sense, rockets basically reach space through a concept known as thrust. And right now we're being held down by the Earth's gravity, so we needed to think of a way to get into space and overcome the gravity. Rockets use fuel that's burned, which produces flames, hot gas, and smoke that cause the rocket to push away from the Earth. And these products expand and push against the rocket, giving it enough energy to boost away from the Earth's surface, which is called thrust. So in a nutshell, the Earth has gravity, and this needs to be overcome to lift off the ground. And burning fuel creates thrust that overcomes this gravity. So as part of Skyrora's incremental learning approach in 2019, we launched a smaller suborbital rocket called Skylark Nano from Scotland. And we'll play a quick video of that launch now. That's great. So then in 2020, we launched a bigger rocket called Skylark Micro from Iceland. And these launches were successful and prepared us for an even bigger launch into space with our Skylark L rocket. So this rocket is approximately 11 meters tall. We attempted to launch Skylark L from Iceland in October 2022, and it was going to take a few science experiments to space for us. However, the rocket experienced what's known in the industry as an anomaly, and the rocket fell into the sea after leaving the launch pad. This was primarily due to a software issue, but failed launch is a normal part of the space industry and we still collected valuable data from that launch that will allow us to try again later this year. And our team is already preparing for this launch. So here's a quick video of our launch attempt. And you can see that we chose a very remote location and that we used our mobile launch complex that I mentioned earlier to conduct the launch. And in addition to collecting valuable data, the launch enabled our team to gain experience operating a launch before our big orbital launch with Skyrora XL. So here it is.
So in addition um, to all of these launches at this point, you may be wondering what exactly Skyroar XL will be taking into space and why. So rockets send many different objects to space. Our rocket will send satellites into a circular path around our Earth called an orbit. And this is an example of what man-made satellites look like and how they move in space. So satellites can measure many things, including temperature, sea level, and cloud cover. They can also take pictures of the Earth, helping us to predict patterns in the environment below. And satellites can also even be sent to other planets. Over the seas, satellites enable researchers to track winds, waves, sea levels, surface temperatures, pollution levels, and biological activity. And on land, satellites can help to monitor crops, forests, soil moisture, urbanization, snow and ice cover, landslides, and even flooding. And satellites can even help to tackle social issues, such as allowing doctors to monitor and treat emergency cases or long-term patients remotely, contributing to disaster management and relief. So my point here is satellites have many different uses and their data is crucial to our lives here on Earth. Satellites can also come in many different sizes. Some satellites are very large and weigh over 1,000 kilograms. So two polar bears can weigh around 1,000 kilograms. So these satellites weigh even more than that, so pretty heavy. But at Skyroro, we're going to be launching small satellites. Some you might even be able to hold in your hands, which are about the size of a Rubik's cube. And some can even be around one kilogram in size, which is about as heavy as a medium sized bag of rice. On the screen here are European Space Agency small satellites called the Race Double CubeSats, and they're about the size of a briefcase. So these small satellites are key to delivering the various kinds of data I mentioned earlier to scientists and researchers here on Earth to solve a wide array of environmental, social, and economic issues. And through our rocket launches, Skyrora hopes to contribute to the collection of this data by placing small satellites into orbit and taking steps towards changing the world for the better. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation and although it was brief, came away learning a little bit more about the UK space agency industry rather and the importance of satellites to our everyday lives. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was really interesting. Um, even just something that you mentioned right at the beginning that I thought was so fascinating was you said that there's a line of satellites waiting to be launched into space. And in just in my head, I never thought of that before. Like there's just a line somewhere of satellites just thinking someday I'll be in space. And I just thought that was so cool to think about that. Um, so is there a long, long line of, of satellites that are needing to get up there that you guys are hoping to help out with? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people don't know this, but Scotland is one of the largest manufacturers of satellites in the world. Um, in Glasgow, we've got Spire, which is a very huge um, satellite manufacturer among many, many others. Um, and we're looking to provide that capability primarily to those satellites located here in Scotland and the UK as well, um, so that they can get to space and do what they're meant to do. That's so interesting. I would have never, I would have never thought of that. Well, I know that I have a million questions. I wrote down a whole bunch on the sticky notes, but it's not about me. We've got some schools out there and some public who have burning questions that they would like to ask you. And if you haven't popped your question in the chat box yet, feel free to do that at any time um, because Nikki is here now to answer your questions. So let's see if we've got any that are coming in yet. And um, like, oh, okay. So here's the first question. Does, oh, we kind of just almost talked about this. Does Skyrora build their own rockets or are they manufactured at other locations? Yeah, so Skyrora designs and manufactures all of our own rockets at our facility, which is actually just outside of Glasgow, uh, maybe a half hour drive from the Science Center. Um, we take great heritage in our designs from the Black Arrow program, which I mentioned um, back in the 1970s. And that program has inspired our liquid bipropellant fuel combination. And lots of our engine components are produced in-house via additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Um, and that's enabled by our printers, which we're calling SkyPrint 1 and 2. And we've actually built those printers ourselves. That is fantastic. I love the idea of a 3D printed rocket. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just even thinking of that, like building a rocket in, in where you are, just it just sounds so cool. I just love it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think we might have another question. Um, oh, okay, this is a really good one. Um, does the weather in Scotland affect the ability to launch rockets? And why might Scotland be a good place to launch rockets from? That's a really good question. So wind levels have the potential to impact rocket launches from Scotland or anywhere, really. Um, and this actually comes down to um, whether the fuel is being um, being used as cryogenic or non-cryogenic, because this can impact the ability to launch rockets in these conditions. 
So with cryogenic fuel, the rocket must be launched as soon as it's fueled up. But with non-cryogenic fuel, the rocket can sit on the launch pad for as long as is needed to wait for the wind levels to die down. And this is why Skyrora uses a non-cryogenic fuel. And besides the volatile weather, Scotland is a really great place to launch rockets from because it provides access to polar and sun synchronous orbits. And these orbits are useful for Earth observation, reconnaissance, and weather satellites, which are uh, many of the uses of our, our clients that we're looking to cater to. That's really cool. And I noticed that you had a mobile rocket launch. So like kind of on the back of the truck, does that mean if you need to just move it down a couple of miles down the road to find a little better location, you could do that? Or do you just basically stick to your rocket launch locations? <laughs> So a lot of planning goes into these rocket launches and we have to work with a lot of regulators in the area that we're launching to ensure that we are meeting the safe and responsible launch that we're trying to achieve. So normally we don't move too far away from where we've planned, um, <laughs> but that is why we um, can wait on the launch pad with our um, non-cryogenic fuel. And then also the mobile launch complex is really easy to wear if for some reason, the weather's not clearing up, we can pack up and maybe try again another time when we've gone through the regulation process again. That's really great. Just a mobile rocket. Sounds perfect. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we've got another question coming in. Um, oh, oh, this is a good one. I like this one. Uh, can anyone launch a rocket into space or satellites? And are there any global policies about what can or cannot be in space? That's a really great question. So this kind of goes back to what I was just mentioning, actually. Um, the ability to launch a rocket into space is governed by the legislation the nation from which you're launching has in place. So, for example, in the UK, the Civil Aviation Authority has to grant launch companies and their satellites on board with a launch vehicle license, which enables them to conduct safe and responsible launch from the UK. And we submitted our launch vehicle license application just last year. And one key document surrounding the formation of global space policies about what can and cannot be in space is the Outer Space Treaty, which basically makes up the foundation for international space law for over 100 nations which have signed it. So basically, the treaty states that weapons of mass destruction are forbidden in orbit. Um, everybody who signed this treaty are responsible for their space activities, including commercial endeavors like Skyrora, and also that nations are responsible for damage caused by their space objects and must avoid contaminating space and celestial bodies. So these are some of the global policies and, and the paperwork, so to speak, that goes into launching rockets and satellites. Well, that's good to know. It's it's nice to know that, uh, you know, not just anything can go up into space and that there are yeah. some regulations in there. That's great. Uh, so I think we've got a live question coming up. Uh, so this is from Amanda Gibbs. How do the satellites work? Uh, from that's Christina, oh, home education. That's a really great question. Thank you, Christina. So I myself am not an expert in satellites by any means, um, but they all have some basic components that make them up that enable them to work in space. And actually one of the biggest components of a satellite is the software on board. So this enables people on the ground to communicate with the satellite once it's in space. And this is why we have ground stations as well, which enable us to communicate once it's up there, because it can be really hard to track sometimes when it's moving in an orbit around the earth um, and the earth is moving. Um, so it's really important to keep track of them. Then additionally, you have to make sure you can integrate the satellite into the rocket so that it arrives in space safely. So there are lots of companies out there that are developing um, basically adapters, which enable the satellite to be securely um, positioned in the payload fairing um, to make sure that it doesn't shake around a lot when it goes up to space. Um, and something interesting about Skyrora and what we do, Again, going back to our fuel that we're using, um, we use a fuel combination that ensures low G loading, which basically um, is the effects of um, going up into space that the shaking, um, the, the environment the satellite experiences when it goes up into space. Um, five Gs is what we use. And that means that it has a lower G loading than other um, fuel combinations so that the satellite goes up smoother to space so that it makes it there safely. But there's a lot of components that go into the satellite, and I'm not going to pretend like I know the answer to, to exactly what goes into it. <laughs> I never personally thought about that, that obviously the satellites get into space, but that they have to get there safely without a lot of rattling around and breaking components. Is there a, a repair in space? What happens if a satellite stops working? That's a really great question. So a lot of times... Um, this is an issue because satellites will become defunct or they no longer work anymore. Um, and we're not able to either deorbit them to make sure they're 
clearing out of space, um, but we also can't necessarily fix them whilst in space. So there's a lot of companies that are actually working on what's known as an orbital transfer vehicle. Um, and that's something that we're working on as well, which can refuel and maintain and fix these satellites in orbit. So we don't have to launch so many extra satellites to replace them and we can decrease the issue of space junk. That sounds great. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Less exactly. Satellites. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. So I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, oh, and this is this is actually kind of what we were just talking about. So if satellites have been left unused for many years, whose responsibility is it to make sure that they get deorbited or they get out of space? Um, and what about all that space trash that's up there that is no longer working, like you just said? Yeah, so many satellites these days, it's really great because they're actually designed to deorbit upon their mission completion, which is really useful. Um, but some of the satellites from the past that are long since defunct or not working are still orbiting above our heads today. And one of these is the UK's Prosper, launched back in the 1970s by the Black Arrow program in Australia. So in September 2022, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission in the United States actually announced a new proposal, which requires operators to remove their satellites from orbit within five years from the completion of their purpose in orbit, which is really helpful because historically this was set at 25 years, meaning a satellite could sit up there for 25 years not doing anything. Um, but many yeah, many believe that time frame was really risky because it could contribute to what's known as the Kessler syndrome, which is basically when there's too many pieces of space junk in space that they're bound to start colliding with each other, which will cause mm -hmm. exponential collisions, which could be really dangerous. Um, so despite this step in the right direction, space junk is still very much a relevant problem we're facing today, especially as we're launching more and more satellites into low Earth orbit. And like I said, that's why Skyrora and other companies are trying to develop these orbital transfer vehicles to deorbit space junk. That's fantastic, especially I never realized that it was that long. Did you say 25 years before? 25 they years. Wow, mm -hmm. that's that's a long time to think about having something spiraling around space uh, without actually working or functioning. Um, OK, so I think we have time for just a few more questions. Um, ooh, OK, so is there a mission control team at Skyrora that are controlling the rockets during launch and in space? So we do have a mission control team that's positioned in our command center, and that's a safe distance away from our launch site. Um, so they make sure that everything is going to plan. And we also have a team monitoring the rocket during launch. Um, but a lot of controls are automatic. Like I said, software is a huge part of rocket launch. So a lot of things can be done automatically. That's really cool. Uh, you know, you get all those video, you know, like in your mind, video people with like headsets and they're all sitting around consoles and they're like, yeah, it's nice to know that you kind of have a little bit of that when you're when you're launching rockets. <laughs> We've got a little bit of both going on there. Yes. <laughs> do you ever get to um, be a part of the rocket launches? Like, do you ever get to be a part of the mission control? So I've never watched a rocket launch from the mission control center, but I've mm -hmm. watched it from the viewing container where um, the rest of our guests are. So oh, wow. back in October, I was in Iceland for our Skylark L launch attempt, and we were up on this big hill. Um, unfortunately, it was kind of foggy that day, but you can hear <laughs> the, the sort of rumble of the ground. Um, and it, it, it makes your heart beat faster. It's so exciting. Um, so oh I'm looking gosh. forward to more launches, hopefully. That sounds so cool. Wow. <laughs> um, all right. I think we have time for one more question. And that is going to be, ah, OK. So what kind of background would someone need to work for a place like Skyrora? That's a really good question. So Skyrora really prides ourselves on hiring people from a diversity of backgrounds many of which are non-traditional to form kind of a unique and multifaceted team with many different perspectives. So although we still look for people from the traditional engineering and physics backgrounds like any other rocket company, we also have many people on our team who come from international business, psychology, financial crime, and even space geology backgrounds. So in short, the space industry is full of non-traditional entry points. And we really look to hire people who fill a gap in our existing team rather than just checking a box. So if you're looking to join the space industry in some capacity and you maybe don't come from that technical background, please don't let this put you off because there's so many opportunities for so many different perspectives in the space industry that will ultimately move us forward. 
That's really good. I get a lot of students who I talk to here at the Science Center who say, oh, I could never do that. I'm not good at maths or I'm not that big into, you know, engineering. And it's really nice to hear that, you know, you've got all these different backgrounds that actually work together and you might not have to be very good at maths because you've got other people who are, but you are good at this skill, which is really cool. And what is your Absolutely. background? Yeah, so my background is international business, um, but believe it or not, I actually wanted to join the music industry when I was in university. So I got a lot of experience in public relations, and then my degree in international business kind of combined made this role something that was really appealing to me, but I never thought I could get into the space industry either, and I didn't even know there was a space industry in Scotland. Um, but I've learned so much over the, the years and realized that... Um, you know, there's a place for everybody and the skills that I bring to the table are different and unique to the skills that other people bring. But mm -hmm. us coming together is what makes it really special. And that's why innovation is being pushed forward, I think. That's fantastic. That's so great to hear. I love hearing your journey. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that is the end of today's Curious About Life session. Um, but from myself and Glasgow Science Centre, I would like to say a really big thank you to you, Nikki Finnegan, for joining us today and talking all about Skyrora and space and your background and sharing that information with us. Um, I'd also like to say a really big thank you to all of those out there who are watching and for your really great questions. Um, we would also love to know what you think about these live sessions. So a link to our brief survey will be popping up um, in the YouTube chat box just now. So please fill that out if you have the time. And if you're finding that you're still curious about new and innovative space technologies, make sure you visit our website, curiousabout.glasgowsciencecenter.com org where we have more fascinating videos quizzes and games to keep you interested but from all of us here uh, at glasgow science center thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time bye bye <laughs>